Hello and welcome back to Random Librarian here on YouTube. I feel like if you're an actual booktuber you're supposed to ask people to subscribe and like things and like engage and drop comments down below so I'm putting that at the beginning now because otherwise I'll forget. Thank you! <laughs> so I am dressed in my most fall outfit ever. Um, I got this shirt recently off of Poshmark. I think it is so ugly and I love it so much. Um, hopefully I can pretend that these are like juniper berries or something and wear it all winter as well as all fall. Because today is an October reading roundup, I figured what better time to wear the most fall outfit in my closet. Overalls, leaves, plaid. Let's go. I actually have had a great, great reading month in part, in large part, because I took some time off of work and that's not something I do very often and it was much needed. It was great. I'm looking at my um, Goodreads because a lot of what I read was on audio or is a book that I have since given to someone else. So future me is already very annoyed with now me about how many different covers I'm gonna have to look up and insert in post. But that's fine, you know? We're living for now. We're not living for like 10 minutes from now. Everything's fine. Uh, also, for reference, today is the 24th, so hopefully six days is enough time for me to edit all of this. No, I'm not thinking about all of the videos that I still haven't edited on my computer. This one will be quick, hopefully. I read Carmilla by Joseph Sheridan Lefanu, but this time I read the version that was edited by Maria Machado and had gorgeous illustrations and her footnotes were super fun. So I started this at the end of September and finished it October 3rd. This I read in college as well and really liked it then. I think I liked it more in college because I had more people to talk about it with and I was able to just compare it to other gothic novels in the Irish sphere and be like, yeah, this one slaps so much harder than Dracula. I don't make the rules, okay? Um, it's a like four star-ish, possibly a little higher for me. Um, just because like it's, it's a great novel for its time, novella for its time, but it's definitely a little sus. Amazing that we have a lesbian vampire to point to and be like, eh? Eh? And that Carmilla the series has been inspired by it, but the actual base material, it's not very friendly to women, and especially women who love women. So, you know, the things that you can pull from it are great, but the base material is like a little sus. <laughs> it is kind of fun that there are elements in there because it's like an earlier vampire story that you do see carried into the vampire stories that we read and consume today. So that's pretty cool. Go Carmilla. Another thing that was interesting is that in the introduction, apparently the letter from Laura that is this huge like celebrated thing because it's actually very much like from a female perspective it feels real it feels like beautiful writing of the era apparently he just lifted that from some other woman's journals or letters like he didn't write that he just included it also he kills laura off before you ever get to meet her which is like not great whatever carmilla pretty high on there i'm not talking about the things that i loved about it because there's so much more to talk about when there's things that you don't like. <laughs> so then after that, I read Each of Us a Desert, which is a perfect book. It's by Marco Shiro. They are incredible. Like, I, I'm in awe of this book. It's told in such a, like, interesting way that takes a minute to get into because you're like, why is... Huh? She's like, hey, let me tell you a story. And she's talking to Solis, which is essentially, like, her her world's god and it's related to the sun and Zos part of the world is that she hears the stories of people around her and is able to give them back to 
Solis and back to the earth and absolve that person of any guilt or negative emotions that they are carrying, which sometimes manifest in actual spirits that haunt these people. So she's very sought after in her hometown and very burnt out. And she ends up going on this journey to try and figure out who she is outside of her hometown. There is a bonkers thing going on in her hometown where someone has taken control essentially and I'm trying to figure out how to say this without like any any twists being revealed because there's so much that happens. So I think I'll just review my review that I posted on bookstagram because I don't think I spoiled anything. So, Each of Us a Desert gives me the same vibes as River Solomon and N.K. Jemisin. Not really in the terms of like, these books are similar, but more in like, holy shit what a book kind of way. They're a little bit similar with The Deep from River Solomon because both authors talk about memory. They, they engage with memory and collective rememberings in a way that is unique to each of them, but also somewhat on the same field because that's not something that every author engages with, especially not in this magically real way. Then for N.K. Jemisin, the world building felt similar in a way because there's like underground societies, um, there are people with different abilities than the general population, there's far fewer of them. But Zoe is like really exalted for her ability to help people, whereas the characters in the Broken Earth trilogy are more hunted in certain variations throughout the book, <laughs> throughout the three books. So yeah, I totally stand by that. Marco Shiro is in great company and uh, they thoroughly deserve it. I stand by my first impressions of this book, which is that it is unique, stunning, rich, uh, it's a journey, both literally and towards like understanding the world, oneself, one's belief system. Every character we meet is like fully realized on the page. The creation of this world and the structure of the storytelling blows me away. So like read this book, please. I also really loved that Oshiro casually threw in side stories of like her wife, his husband, their partner, like the whole world is very real and like there's no issue. People are just like, oh yeah, that person, regardless of their gender, loves that person, regardless of their gender, and it made me really happy. And we have like people of all genders basically willing to do whatever it takes for the people that they love, which I think is also very relatable. Love that is like familial, romantic, platonic, brought about by a sense of duty. And we have a love story, but it's gloriously slow burn. And that is so my jam. Oh my gosh, it was so, so good. Basically, I mean, read this book. It's also stunning. I was really proud of this picture. Marco Shiro shared it. I literally screamed aloud on my walk to get coffee. It's fine, everything's fine. Okay, so <laughs> that's, the second book I read in October. <laughs> this is gonna be a long video, isn't it? The next three books that I read are the Heartstopper graphic novels by Alice Oseman, volume one, two, and three. These were easy five-star reads for me. I read them all in one sitting, essentially. They're quick, they're inclusive. I want full novels, full series, full, like, bookcases of every character in this book getting their own like spin-off because we have we have Nick and Charlie whose romance is center stage but also all of their friends are just oh they make me happy they make my heart warm we get like little extra stories included in like two of the volumes <sighs> anyways they're uh those three books and whenever I would like the fourth one now please are so 
fun and such a great break because they do talk about like important things uh consent comes up or like timing in a relationship um obviously sexuality and uh lgbtq concerns plus then it's also just like a high school story and there's wonderful friendships and there's wonderful relationships they have great teachers they go on a trip to france which i wish we were still able to do right now <laughs> and yeah i mean they also talk about coming out and how i think that a lot of times there are certain pressures that we expect to be put on stories with gay protagonists um i was worried that a friend was going to out them as a couple because it seemed like maybe that could be a plot point and Nick was kind of accidentally outed the year before and that didn't happen and I was like thank god so then that didn't happen I was really glad actually because it was just like all that stress for nothing they had a great conversation about when the right time would be for Charlie to come out because he just figured out that he wanted to date a boy very much just he just having conversations and being in love and made me happy hopefully some of that makes for a good review <laughs> read all three of them they're great <laughs> I listened to the amber spyglass which was a whole re-listen but I listened to the first two books so the golden compass and the subtle knife in September this was my October finishing of that series. I mean, it's uh, such a good series. I had forgotten a lot of the content of the second two books. So rereading it, I was just, I got to experience a lot of the twists and turns as if it was my first time reading it. So very fun. Loved that for me. Thank you, Philip Pullman. <laughs> then next up, I read Wicked Fox, which is just, such a good book. Oh my gosh. If you saw my videos with Shelby when she was here, you'll know that I bought Vicious Spirit, which is book two, which just came out. I bought it in hardback, which I don't normally do. I don't love hardbacks, which is going to be funny when I show you the rest of the books that I read this, this month, but it's fine. It was a perfect mix between K-dramas, which can be absolutely ridiculous, but are very comforting to me uh, in a way that <laughs> I just, I'm not gonna get over. They're, they're very fun and also make me feel like my life is going so well. So there's a mix between that and like these mythological elements of stories and um, myths of <laughs> Korea that I didn't know beforehand. So I got to learn a bit about a different culture and they're like monsters under the bed and I got to experience this story and all of these crazy like highs and lows and, and roller coaster, really. So I am really excited to read book two. I read book one as part of my October month of reading. Then next up, we're gonna get into the books that I still have. I finished this brick of a book, so A Court of Wings and Ruin. Um, I also have a video coming out with Shelby about our thoughts on the whole series of um, Echo Tar because there's so many thoughts to be had. Comparing this to the rest of the books, I thought that this was actually better. I don't know if it is like good because comparing it to books that I like, it's not. But within the actual like series, I was like, okay, there's been a lot of progress here. There's a plot. Things happen in this book. <laughs> And um, yeah, so I gave this one four stars. I'm like questioning it now that I'm thinking about it, but like that was my initial instinct because compared to the other ones, it's so much better. <laughs> so there we go, Sarah J Mass, A Court of Wings and Ruin. Things happen in this book. After that, I read A House in the Cerulean Sea. <laughs> So I love TJ Klune. I've been reading um, the his werewolf series, Green Creek novels, which the last one just came out for uh, that series. So I'm very excited. I don't really want it to end though, so I haven't started the third book yet because it's three out of four, 
So if I start the third one, then I'll have to admit that the fourth one is out and I should read it and then it's done. And I don't want it to be done. But this one, The House in Cerulean Sea, is I think the book that a lot of people saw first from TJ Klune. This and The Extraordinaries are his most recent publications. And this one is very different from all of his other published works, actually. It's they're, it's following an adult character, firstly. Um, the other ones at least follow characters through their teenage years. This we get certain flashbacks to um, Linus's childhood, but for the most part, Linus is the adult. And he has got a kind of bleak existence as a caseworker in the um, magical youth area of the government. So it's Department in Charge of Magical Youth. And it's Dai Kami. Yes, and he's 40 years old. He has a cat. He has a house that is very dreary in a city where it always rains and his only like bright spot are his sunflowers. And he really wants to go to the ocean, but he's never seen it before. And he doesn't take vacations because when he takes a vacation, they call him back into work. I identified so much <laughs> with Linus, but um, minus the, the fun side characters. So Linus gets sent by extremely <laughs> upper management to an island where um, top secret children are being raised in a Daikami home. So, it goes off from there, and um, their care caretaker is a very attractive man, because T.J. Clune always has a gay romance, and I loved it. Um, I cried everything, but I was like happy crying at this book. It was so, so good. <laughs> so that one was definitely a five star for me. Then I read... The Invisible Life of Daddy LaRue by V.E. Schwab, because everyone is, and um, normally I try to avoid the hype because I am... Yeah, I'm gonna blame this on the fact that I'm a Taurus. So I'm pretty stubborn if someone tells me I should like something, uh, sometimes my inner rebel kicks in and I'm like, you know what? No, I don't think I'm going to. That I don't think that's what happened here. I don't really know what happened here because this should have been a book that I really like. And I'm not saying it's bad. I just didn't really fully connect to it or the characters. I'm very confused about why, because it seems like it's tailor-made to be related to by people of my generation, and especially we the bookworms. But, uh, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I guess that's really all I gotta say about that. Like, it's got, it's got all these fun aspects, like magical realism. I'm sure you've heard enough about this book that I can just say that without context. Magical realism, um, casual queerness, we love, uh, history, France, all good things, all things I love, but eh. Is not for me. I don't know why. So, if someone wants to like flip a switch in my brain, realign my <laughs> reading days. I think really I should have just waited until the hype had died down and maybe I would have liked it more at some other point. <laughs> when I didn't have like people being like, this book is incredible, this is the best book I've read of the year. That's really what's like filling my feed. So I think if maybe I didn't have those high expectations for it, I would have liked it more, but I just didn't connect. Also, they could have mentioned the number of freckles she has half as much. Oh my god, her freckles were essentially another main character. Just on their own. Existing. On her face. Eh. Not a fan. I'm a super fan of this next one though. We have Cemetery Boys by Aiden Thomas. I did a full video about this because I got the uh, Illumicrate box of Cemetery Boys. This book is perfection. It's so good. It's so good. This is magical realism, but handled in a way that is just like re reach, rich and cultural and... Uh, it's so 
good. It's so good. It's so good. I love all the characters in here. They're actually like fully realized three-dimensional people. Um, yeah, I want, I want everyone to read this book. It's perfection. So that was a five-star read for sure. The next three are ones that I read and then gave away. So that is Sheets by Brenna Thumler, Pumpkin Heads by Rainbow Rowell, and Faith Erin Hicks, and Older But Better But Older by Caroline Demegri and Sophie Mass. So Sheets follows a middle grade child as she runs her family's laundromat. <laughs> Why does this child have a full-time job? Like, where are social services? I don't understand. But suspend your disbelief. Her mother has died. Her father is checked out. She's raising her younger brother and running a business while attending school. So there's a lot going on. She's also very depressed because she's still dealing with a lot of grief. Um, yeah, and then all of a sudden, a ghost comes into her life. And at first he seems like he's messing a lot of stuff up. Um, he builds a blanket for it out of the clothes that she's supposed to give back to people. So the next morning when she wakes up, she has to like frantically fold all this stuff. Someone's trying to take over the spot where the laundromat is. There's a lot of like intrigue and friendship. Wendell and Marjorie become friends. It's really great. So that's a fun, it was a fun like quick read. Um, I would read the second volume. I don't know if or when that has come out. Sheets number, it's just sheets number one. So then we have a sheets story and delicates. Okay, so she has other, Brenna Thumler has other books in this series. So I'll definitely have to go check those out from the library. I don't know if I would buy them again, but it was a fun thing to read over October. Oof. The same thing can be said for pumpkin heads. If I'm comparing sheets to pumpkin heads, I like sheets so much better. Pumpkin heads is very formulaic and you know what's gonna happen and who's gonna get together <laughs> by the end of the book, basically within the first like five pages. So pumpkin heads follows best or seasonal best friends, um, Deja and Josiah who work together at a pumpkin patch every fall. They, uh, I don't really know what they do because I don't know what that food is that they're making. It's also their last year doing this because they're going off to college. So there's this sense of like nostalgia and saying goodbye even though they're still together and saying goodbye to the pumpkin patch. Josiah has a crush on a girl and he's never spoken to her so Deja makes it her like mission for the night to put him somewhere where, or like get him to talk to her and give her his phone number so that they can go off and do stuff. Now I'm sure you can guess where this is going. In their adventure of the night, Josiah realizes that he actually likes Deja and they should be together and they should figure some stuff out. So there you go. It's sweet. I will give you that. We also get some casual queerness in this book as well because Deja, we get to meet a bunch of Deja's exes who all work at the pumpkin patch and we she's dated both men and women. So go Deja. We love her. It's like not unique, but it was still a fun read and I think I actually kind of look like what they're wearing right now. So... If pumpkin patches were around this year, this is what I would wear to one. Next, I had Older But Better But Older. Uh, I had read their first book in like college, I think, over the summer when I was bummed that I wasn't in France. <laughs> she, uh, They, together, had published the book How to Be Parisian, I think, wherever you are. Um, this one wasn't as good. It like talks about aging and being a woman and dating and um, families and stuff, but it takes a weird tone where it seems like they're trying to be like, oh, women do X when it's like something very specific. So eh. it's a very quick read. I think I read it in like a couple of hours, um, but it's like a two star for me. 
I do like multimedia though. There are photos and um, quotes and stuff included in it. I sent that off to a francophone friend. Next thing I did is I listened to Truly Devious by Maureen Johnson on Libby. I immediately placed a hold for the second one. I have it. I'm listening to it. This series is really fun. And it, it I mean, it's very much like up my alley. We have Stevie, who is a true crime aficionado, is trying to solve the actual murder that took murder and kidnapping that took place at this school when it was at her school when it was first founded. It's a school where they don't tell you what their application requirements are, which is something that really would have made my like preteen heart freak out. <laughs> so it's this like weird mystical place full of people who have some kind of like it factor and they don't really tell you what that factor is that they're looking about but everyone has their thing and Stevie's thing is true crime and she wants to solve the mystery that happened while she's trying to solve the mystery though someone gets murdered and maybe it has something to do with truly devious the person who wrote the letter about the f or to Ellingham who is the founder of the school or is that the school's name Okay, it's both. She, Truly Devious is like what this letter has come to be known as because it ends that way. And she wants to solve the Truly Devious murders. While well, this is all happening, a murder happens and there was a projection onto her wall in the middle of the night that had a poem in the same vein, signed Truly Devious. She thinks it was a hallucination or a dream or like a panic attack which panic attacks are handled really, I think, really well in this book because we get different facets of things and we get a part of her reaction where if other people are panicking, she doesn't. And I identify with that hardcore. So I love Stevie as a narrator. The audiobook was so good. We go back and forth between like the past and the present. I think in the books you actually get like photos of the Truly Devious letter and what it looks like so I think reading it would also be a very interesting experience. I just love Libby and they had all three books available so I'm listening to the second two now. Very fun. High four star for me. Then I have read the first of the Throne of Glass series again by Sarah J Maas. Um, a lot of my friends on Bookstagram are very obsessed with Sarah J Maas, so I just got swept up in the hype. Um, this was actually fun. Like, this was a better book than the entire Akatar series. I think there are definitely, like, two kinds of people when it comes to Sarah J Maas, and you either liked Akatar or you liked Throne of Glass, and you think the other one is not as good but people seem to read everything nonetheless. So things happen in this novel. We have a lot going on. <laughs> I've seen some people be annoyed that Selena is, um, like, she sleeps in a lot. She likes wearing floofy dresses. Um, she's an assassin. So they think that those things are incongruous. But you know, like, if I had been in a in a labor camp for a year, I think also I would be a bit of a brat when I came out because, I mean, I don't really know how I would react to that. That sounds awful and very stressful, but that's kind of the point. You don't know how you would react to things. What we're getting is that she is reacting by being kind of frivolous and then having nightmares during the night. Those can all happen. So there's a lot going on here. I'm definitely gonna read the second book. I have the whole series because I have an obsessive personality and if I do something, I'm doing it all the way. So that's that. And then I have started a bunch of things. So I'll tell you about the books that I've started in October because why not? All right, the pile of books that I've started slash plan to start this month is also kind of crazy because there are What day is it? Six, it's like a week left in the month. <laughs> it's fine, it's fine. I'm not gonna be able to finish all of these, but you know what? They count towards this video, I think. So I started The Regrets by Amy Bonifonce because there's a ghost involved. 
Um, I thankfully have been made aware that it is a dual perspective book because I don't really like being in Thomas's head. He is a lot. I mean, he seems like being a hipster for the sake of being a hipster, and then um, oh, most of what we've learned about Thomas is that he has uh, sexual fixation and a death wish based on an interaction he had with an angel slash angel of death slash Scythe, because that's a book, a uh, series that I need to finish, at a very young age. Um, so yeah, I'm really looking forward to getting into, I think her name is Rachel, Rachel's perspective, because I don't like Thomas's head. It's not fun to be in there. Uh, then, I had also started this while waiting for Shelby to arrive. So like immediately after finishing A Court of Wings and Ruin, I have this, it is a novella. Shelby tells me that I shouldn't read it because it will make me hate life and the fact that this exists. Um, but once I get through it, I'm gonna give away the whole series on Instagram. So if you like the new covers, they could be yours for the low, low price of a follow and a like. Possibly a comment. So that should be <laughs> life ruining. Then I have Crown of Midnight, book two, Court of Thrones, uh, <laughs> book two of Throne of Glass. So we're off to a good start already. She had a severed head that she threw at the king. Very fun. Um, and apparently she's actually just like telling people that uh, they can either be murdered or leave and change their names and never come back and then she takes a dead body and mutilates it, so. Way to go, Selena! <laughs> then I also started Rebecca because I want to watch the movie. Also Shelby told me I needed to read it and I was dumb and didn't realize that this was not Anne of Green Gables, so. Rebecca, we are off to a spooky start. I don't love any of the editions that I have seen, but this is a trade paperback and it's somewhat less egregious. Then uh, I also started a couple things on Kindle <laughs> because can't stop, won't stop. One of these is Legend Born, which is off to a very good start. I love Brie, both before Brie and after Brie. Poor girl's got a lot of grief to work through. So far, I haven't gotten to any of the magical elements, but I'm very excited for an Arthurian legend retelling with a black girl as the main character. This is great. I think I started some other things on Kindle, but I am fully not remembering right now. I am listening to Plain Bad Heroines. I already said I'm listening to book two and then book three of Maureen Johnson's series. Then, what else do we got here? Oh, I also have A Discovery of Witches and Felicia is in Trouble as Lucky Day Loans from the library, so those are on my phone and I'm reading those there. Yay! Chaos! So fun! Then finally, I have Vampires Never Get Old, Tales with Fresh Bite, because who doesn't love a short story anthology, especially one around vampires, especially in Halloween? This one I'm actually probably gonna finish before the end of the month. Cause it's very vibey. Then other things that I know I'm getting to possibly in October, possibly in November, are the Midnight Library. Anna from Girls Who Read Around told me that she like cried a lot at reading this. So that means that I'm probably gonna be able to cry enough tears to make tea with them. Um, because I cry at everything <laughs> and Anna cries at nothing. So this book is probably gonna wreck, wreck me completely. I like the British cover better, but that's fine. Then I am starting a buddy read of this thick book, which is Priory of the Orange Tree. I have heard great things about it. I have been very intimidated by its size. I think I'm starting it November 1 with 
frankly bookish on bookstagram so thank goodness for meg really because otherwise i Ooh, i'd have some trouble getting into this by myself how many pages is this thing oh my god that's there's persons of the tale and that's a lot of pages um i think the story is 804 and then the book through the characters and the glossary is, and to end a timeline of events is 827 pages. So that's a thing. Okay, um, well, this has been a video about things I read in October slash started reading in October slash hopefully we'll read soon. I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> if you did, uh, let me know if you've made it this far. Wow, thank you. Um, and I think I'm done for with being entertaining and on camera today. So yeah, I'll see you guys in another video. I got a lot of reading to do. Bye.